So it's um, Easter week and uh, I just thought it might be a good idea to put um, out a couple of thoughts um, about uh, what it is that Christians celebrate over this time. Uh, with all the uncertainty around us at the moment and as well as the fear and anxiety, I wonder whether um, some people are thinking a little bit more uh, about spiritual things, our confidence uh, in human beings to keep the show on the road uh, might well have been knocked just a little bit uh, during these days. If you're watching in Winsford, then I, I know many of you. Uh, we've met at schools and funerals and maybe even occasionally at the pub. Um, I suppose Easter is the most important part of the year for Christians. Uh, Christmas is always fun, of course, but there are also many distractions. We, we do really need to keep these events together anyway. At Christmas, we remember the birth of Jesus. Uh, and at Easter, we remember why Jesus came, his death and resurrection. Uh, and either one without the other doesn't make much sense. So this is the first talk, just for a few minutes, going to think about the death of Jesus and then... Uh, I'll speak a little bit more in a, in a second talk about the resurrection of Jesus. But let me start with this, with some thoughts about the death of Jesus that we remember particularly on Good Friday. Since I was a, a small child, this has intrigued me for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, because of what is said in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you you might know them and you might have read parts of them in the past. Uh, they are really biographies of the life of Jesus, uh, written either by or on behalf of an eyewitness. They all claim to be writing history. Uh, there are many verifiable historical details, uh, but they also include accounts of extraordinary events. And throughout these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus is most commonly called the Christ. This is amazing and it is a huge claim. Uh, let me show you what it means. Uh, here we have a Bible and in the Bible there are 66 separate books from Genesis through to Revelation. Uh, the first 39 books of the Bible make up the Old Testament and then the second 27 make up the New Testament. Really, the, the first 39 books of the Old Testament, uh, going from Genesis, which just means beginnings, uh, through to uh, the prophet Malachi, uh, those first 37 books, uh, 39 books, sorry, uh, are really um, the promise that someone will come, sent by God, God's anointed king, to deal with sin and death uh, and to bring people back into relationship with God. And uh, the, the title Christ, um, as I say, that the most common title given to Jesus himself in those four Gospels just means anointed king. And so when Jesus is called the Christ, we're really being told that all the promises of those 39 books of the Old Testament are being kept in him. He is the one uh, who comes to fulfil all the promises that God has made. And then, you see, as the Gospels develop and show us the person of Jesus, we get what we would expect to get, if that's who he is. We see Jesus Christ showing complete authority over sickness and death and nature, and even claiming the authority to forgive sins. These events are all a bit weird, unusual, but then this life, this unique life, needs to be marked out for us so that we don't miss the significance of what is happening. But then I wonder, have you noticed this? Almost half of each of those Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, is given over to the preparation and explanation and event of the death of Jesus. And this just isn't what we usually do. I have read countless biographies of famous dead people and hardly any time is given over to describe their deaths. Maybe half a page, maybe a paragraph. But the biographers of Jesus 
seem to want to show that his death was central to the very purpose of his life. And it's more than the Gospels. The rest of the New Testament says the same. It is mainly made up of letters to churches or church leaders around the Mediterranean Sea. And in these letters, we get lots of teaching about what the death of Jesus meant. And again, it is his death that is central to their explanation of his life. In a letter to a church leader in Ephesus, uh, we find these words. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In other words, the Christian claim is that the purpose of the life of Jesus was his death and what it would achieve. But imagine if I did that. Imagine if I stood up at a funeral with a, a grieving but proud family in front of me, keen to remember someone's achievements. And imagine I said that the most important thing they had done was to die. I'm not sure the smiles would be particularly forthcoming as we left the building. There's just something going on here, isn't there? Something that God wants us to notice. Something that led the church to remember the death of its founder by calling the day Good Friday. Something that makes Christians across the ages and across the world celebrate the cross. Here's a few things that I think we all need to ask in response. I wonder whether you've ever asked these questions uh, and I wonder if you will ask them, please, this Easter time. The first question is this, am I a sinner? We read that Jesus Christ comes into the world to save sinners. Am I a sinner? Am I being included there? And the answer is yes. The answer is it applies to every human being. I have not lived in God's world and recognised God's authority over my life. I have pretended to be God over my own life. It's been a pathetic pretense. Rather than trust the one who is God. Sometimes I've done this by active rebellion or sometimes just by passive indifference. Both are serious. Both break my relationship with God. Both mean that I live in alienation from God now. And will face his terrifying judgment at the end of human history. Am I a sinner? Yes. Did Jesus die for me? Yes, again, yes. The New Testament says that Jesus died for anyone who will trust him. As he dies, he bears the punishment of God for anyone who will trust him. And because he is the son of God, as Jesus dies on the cross and utters those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God in some way is sacrificing himself. So that all who trust Jesus can be forgiven. This is extraordinary grace and love, extraordinary compassion and mercy. Can I be forgiven by God? Again, wonderfully, resoundingly, yes. Whoever I am and whatever I've done, I can know a new start with God. The God who made me and who owns my life and before whom one day I will stand as my judge. Yes, I can know a new start with that God. In our community here, there are many who have experienced this. Winsford people and people who've moved to Winsford from all over the world. I think of the person who I met a few years ago who said to me, I'm 37 years old and my life's a car crash. Can anyone help me? That person is now a dear friend and a, a lovely Christian. But be careful. The forgiveness of God is needed by all of us, whether we think we need it or not. The Bible says we all do. In the first few verses of John's Gospel, one of those biographies that I mentioned earlier, in the first few verses of John's Gospel, we read these words, To all who received Jesus, to all who believed in his name, 
he gave them the right to be children of God. I wonder what is the greatest privilege you've ever known. Uh, I received this week in the post a membership card. I don't suppose there are many members of this exclusive club in Winchford. It's the, the Barmy Army, the England uh, Travelling Cricket Supporters Club. It's not really a great privilege, is it? The greatest privilege is to be a child of the God who gave us life in the first place. Not just for this life, but forever. And if that is to be the case for me and for you, then we need to be forgiven by God. The death of Jesus makes that real and true for anyone who trusts him.